welcome everyone. Your favorite live streaming is back. NetGuru is here today to talk about building engineering culture, because as you know, there is no harder topic in tech than engineers hiring, retaining, maintaining, but also just making sure that when you are retaining them, you are retaining them in a place where they are not only happy on a personal level, but also very productive on what they've been hired for. So joining me today is Wukas. Wukas is our head of QA department, the big boss of all testing at NetGuru. Hi, Wukas. Hi, hello. Hi. Pleasure to be here today. Pleasure is all mine. So we're going to be talking about building engineering culture. So uh, as always, this is a very fitting role for me, uh, ignorant person with many questions and childlike curiosity. Tell me, engineering culture, define it for me because you know i understand it as engineering i have engineers the culture of treating them their day to day but also their week to week month to month career path uh am i wrong am i right what am i missing right uh, obviously it's not an easy topic it needs to uh we need to go deeper to understand it well and if you hear it a lot here and there engineering culture appears in many different publications in videos in podcasts uh in meetings like that and you kind of start thinking that uh it's a buzzword uh same as uh, devops was or anything that you know happens when you repeat it a lot uh you start to think that it's a buzzword but then um well, we are used to um, things moving dynamically in IT, right? Uh, it's, it's, it's been uh, like that for a while now. And uh, well, and, and things like um, um, pandemic, they, they, they became even, uh, uh, it accelerated things even more, right? They became a catalytic mechanism of that. So we are in a phenomena of digital acceleration even. So uh, you might, you know, build a rocket to, to, to fly to the moon, but uh, if you do it quickly without, you know, uh, including this craftsmanship inside it, uh, it's going to crash at the, at the first launch. So you don't want to do that because it will move you away from your goal, from your goal actually. It will uh, harm you and uh, actually you won't move forward. So one way to think about it is to make sure that engineers are becoming important stakeholders of your, of your company business decisions. So whatever you're trying to build, uh, uh, keep them on board, uh, make them included and figure out ways to actually um, you know, uh, m make sure that uh, the craftsmanship is there and uh, engineers are contributing uh, and you consult things with them uh, so that eventually when you build that rocket, uh, it actually launches without any any failures and you can you know, move forward with whatever uh, your dream is uh, with your business. But then uh, there are also two other things uh, to that, uh, I think. Um, one is making sure that uh, it's also enjoyable for them because, you know, it's, it's, it's always easier for people to be on board uh, when, uh, when they are enjoying things that they are doing. So um, including engineers would be not enough, uh, in my opinion. Uh, you also want to make sure that whatever they do is actually enjoyable for them. Uh, that uh, they are having fun actually doing those things because uh, then uh, it will be easier for them to you know to figure out ways to to help you with uh, with whatever uh, is is it that uh, that you're doing and I think the third important factor in that um, is to make sure that you remove all the frictions that appear on the way because well you might have them on board uh, they might be enjoying things uh, they might be on board with the product or service that you're doing. But then uh, if there are, there are going to be things that are slowing them down, um, sort of red taping here and there, it's going to be discouraging <clears throat> for them. So um, so then, uh, you know, it, it, it becomes painful to actually do things on a daily basis if you need to fight for things. Uh, and I think these are these are the three ingredients that are very important to start the discussion even. Of course, there's a lot more to the picture uh, it's just one of the the ways you might you know, start thinking about uh, engineering culture and and how to start building it in your uh, in your business in your company first of all welcome our dear audience i see people popping up in the comments nice to see you again and uh, Lukas, i'm 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 loving and i'm sort of not loving i'll tell you why the analogy for the rocket ship because i'm not loving it because you cannot really leave a rocket ship whilst it's already launched right so that would be dangerous for everybody involved both the person leaving and the people inside but otherwise uh, i think i think it's a very apt 
simile in terms of, you know, uh, there's a there's a mission that begins before launch. You need preparation. Then you need everybody to be on the same page during, and you know, you definitely don't only want them to be prepared, but you also want them to be looking forward to the flight and the landing, right? So, uh, right. I think that's a, that's a really on point comparison. Um, so, uh, Culture Amp, shout out to Culture Amp. We use it at NetGuru, uh, uh, employee analytics platform uh, for many questioners. And at NetGuru, we quarterly collect feedback. And we have some quotes, right, Wukash, from, from, our, uh, from our engineers concerning precisely what defines their culture. So, no better way to hear from the engineers themselves uh, what it is. So, do you have some favorites you could share or anything that surprised you? Exactly. Nice. You, you brought it up. Uh, you, you cannot build engineering culture without engineers, right? So uh, the question we ask when, when we are running this culture, and one of the questions is uh, what defines an engineering culture to actually ask our people uh, what they think uh, is contributing to their well-being and, um, you know, enables cultivating this this culture of, of engineering uh, on board and uh, well there are, there are a lot of things there um, if I were to choose my my favorite there are there are a few of them actually so I, I, I won't just go with a single one uh, I'm just go, I'm gonna quote uh, a few of them uh, so uh, generally speaking they are all um, gathered around three uh, three different things one is uh, collaboration so making sure that there is open mind, there's a willingness to uh, grow, uh, there's transparency what, uh, regarding what we can and cannot do, uh, shared approach to problem solving. So all those things um, um, sort of uh, related to uh, collaborating and making sure that you know, we are working uh, well as a team. Uh, then there's the other part uh, regarding uh, working standards, uh, possibility, uh, you know, uh, having time for, for research and uh, development, well-described processes and operations. So sort of those um, um, way of working uh, stuff uh, that, is under, uh, that is underneath. Uh, so all those things, uh, this is also uh, really, really important. And of course, uh, there has to be um, some space for knowledge sharing because only then um, uh, we can learn from each other. So uh, making sure that uh, there's an opportunity to actually reach out to all your fellow uh, colleagues um, whenever you're stuck with something, whenever you need some help. Uh, and also uh, whenever there's uh, anything that went wrong, uh, sharing those experiences, um, making sure that uh, we do a sort of post-mortem, we learn from, from successes, but also from failures. Um, so, um, so having that in place, uh, that, that also appears in the, in the quotes from, from our, uh, culture amp, um, insights. Okay. I, I was just making notes when I was listening to you to try to right. sort of get the, the keywords. So I, I'm hearing processes. So essentially, even if you just wake up in the middle of the night, you can look at the description, you know what to do standards so just making sure that you know uh i mean standards we don't really need to define the word standards uh the mindset inviting uh you know questioning things being able to challenge stuff each other but also in a very coming back to standards civil manner everybody gets to have their say but you know you also want to make sure even for the benefit of your argument that you're being convincing not criticizing um and uh, even more so from challenging and questioning each other to knowledge sharing. So like I said, the, the intent really matters. So that sounds like uh, the contents of, of fuel for the rocket ship of engineering culture, pretty much what you just described. Mm -hmm. um, so these are you know, things that you mentioned. They sound like abstract concepts in some sense right because every company every rocket ship will have their own definition of that but i'm pretty sure that there are some pillars some fundamentals right so of course this is going to sound really uh, cheesy but w w you being in the guru delivery what would you say are our pillars our fundamentals the things that are the basis for those concepts that you just mentioned to rely on 
Right. Well, obviously, as you said, it's it's not an easy topic. Uh, and there's also this one bit to it uh, that is very important. Just yesterday, I was uh, on a really inspiring presentation uh, when uh, there was this quote, you know, from um, from uh, I think I believe it was Mike Tyson who coined this phrase that, you know, your plans as uh, are, are very good. Uh, but then uh, um, they, they are valid uh, up till uh, um, you get punched in the face, right? So, uh, so making you know having that that in uh, in the back of your head um, that we might have you know a plan or we, we might have grounds, but uh, we need to be prepared that these things are changing because. <clears throat> And normally we probably would be working with complex systems and complex systems are ever changing. So, um, so you cannot have, you know, one single plan and then uh, believe that it's going to work in all the contexts that you're going to be in. However, as you said, um, having solid grounds uh, um, allows you to have some sort of a starting point right uh they are rarely spectacular because well normally when you're building a house or a rocket or anything that you're building uh well fundamentals fundamentals are are really spectacular but they are holding the entire construction so uh without them uh properly crafted the whole thing would collapse right so yeah we, we um based on based on our experiences uh throughout years throughout um I would say hundreds of different projects. Uh, we try to, you know, kind of extract those uh, things that are repeatable that we can, you know, uh, treat as our fundament uh, uh, to start with. Uh, so I'm gonna um, maybe I'm not gonna quote all of them, uh, but I'm gonna touch upon some of uh, some of the interesting parts. Uh, so we we ended up uh, crafting uh, the thing that we called the delivery fundamentals uh, that are binding together this uh, this existing experience this knowledge and all those learnings coming from those from those uh, numerous uh, project we, we did three years and uh, when w one of the interesting things is uh, we're making always making sure that we are doing the right thing so the worst that can happen to you is uh, to put your energy uh, towards something that eventually uh, will not be uh, will not be used so spending hours on something that in the end, is not what we really wanted uh, or we were asked to be doing, uh, but, but we end up solving, uh, not solving the, the, the right uh, problem. So um, finding ways to actually understand uh, what, what, what's, uh, what's the thing that we are uh, building, what's the business value behind it, um, what are the goals, what is the end goal of uh, the thing that, uh, that we are building, a really important thing. And there's no single answer how to go forward with that, right? Um, in different contexts, in different teams, um, there are, there are going to be different practices or processes or anything that you have in place uh, to make sure you answer this question right. But uh, your leading question should be, how do we make sure that we are, we are building the right thing at every moment throughout uh, our project or uh, whatever that it is that, that uh, we are doing? So it's a it's a good starting point. Um, one other thing that I really like uh, is the is the culture of of uh, continuous learning. So we mentioned that already mm, at the beginning uh, when we were starting uh, discussing this topic, that um, w within the complex environments, within uh, the uh, all the dynamics that we have uh, around those projects, um, we need to embrace the fact that uh, there are going to be failures. Uh, so it's not going to be, you know, always unicorns and rainbows. Uh, eventually there, there's going to be some bumpy road uh, somewhere there. So making sure that uh, we have in place all the things that actually enable us uh, to learn from those um, and, you know, uh, not having uh, anything that is, uh, you know, a blaming uh, culture or anything like that, but rather treating all those, uh, you know, bumpy things ahead of us as an opportunity to grow and learn uh, and be better at things that we are doing along the way. Uh, this is also really, I think, a really nice, nice pillar. Um, so uh, whenever, whenever uh, such learning opportunity shows up. Uh, making sure that uh, the teams use this opportunity, use this chance uh, to actually, uh, you know, uh, get something out of it uh, and and move forward. <clears throat> okay. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just, you know, I was just making notes because I wanted to go back to what you said a moment ago. Um, you mentioned business value because this is very important for people to understand. Of course, the metaphors start getting very tricky at some point because, you know, uh, fundamentals of a ha foundation of a house or the fundamentals of a rocket ship are, are, are one thing. But essentially what we mean when we say that is is the strategy, which is the course at which the rocket ship should stay at all times, assuming the goal of business value. But, you know, a strategy is your point of reference. It doesn't mean something that you're not supposed to adapt, not supposed to change. It's supposed to be something that if you change, you're supposed to eventually go back to the strategy because it's leading to the business value. And likewise here, if you are on a rocket ship and there's a meteor running your way, you could just stick to your strategy or you could, you know, just uh, make sure nobody, nobody gets injured. So uh, I think exactly. that's that's what's important for people to remember and this is for engineering and everything else business life that strategy is the thing that is your north star metric but not something that you just blindly follow and never uh never adapt i like what you said about no blaming and also something that's very applicable to every other aspect of life blaming is very inefficient it's not productive it's not conducive to anything accountability is right so people being exactly. able to own up to their stuff and accountability goes both ways. I messed up. It's my sort of responsibility to remedy it uh, or the other way. I did a great thing and uh, you can be sort of held accountable for for that as well. So um, and yeah. in, in both cases, uh, either making sure that it, if it's a failure, it doesn't repeat for future. So trying to understand what was the root cause of it and, uh, you know, uh, applying uh, things that are going to improve over time or the other way around as you said when it's a success finding a way to actually repeat it to you know um, transform it to something that we can reuse uh, in in future endeavors definitely so i, I wanted to talk about uh, uh, red flags here especially that uh, right now with the with the market we're hearing a lot of things i think even just not yesterday, but the day before yesterday evening, I've seen the screenshots from uh, um, from Elon Musk's email to to his employees, and there are very very uh, divided opinions on this. Uh, I don't want to make this the topic of the conversation. Just wanted to use this as a, as a transition. And but, but I gotta say, if you're doing stuff like Elon Musk, like you're trying to change the world of uh, automotive, you're trying to get us into space. I can sort of see why his argument might make sense. It's not just another company. It's a company where you're trying to do literally moonshot things. So apart from such exceptional companies where one might be able to make the argument of, you know, this is not a place where you will see the typical culture of employment or engineering. Let's look at the rest of the normal world. Uh, what would be the red flags? Because we've been talking about what constitutes a great foundation for engineering culture and then engineering culture itself. So now my question is, what are big no-nos? What are the things that should worry you if you're looking at a company, if you're trying to get recruited somewhere, You, anything that you might hear, see that you are not building a strong engineering culture or even worse, you're building it a bad one? Right. So we, we started with um, discussing a lot about, uh, you know, uh, having a collaborative workspace. Uh, we we uh, touched upon a little bit uh, on, on uh, strong processes and tools uh, and also not forgetting about quality. Actually, we didn't get to that, this one, but uh, we're going to uh, I'm going to mention it uh, as well as my background is quality. So so obviously I don't want to, um, um, you know, uh, skip this topic. But uh, answering your question, uh, I would say uh, a, a good starting point is to understand if there's anything going against those things that we are that we just discussed so basically if you're going against collaboration if you're not enabling that and it's it's a difficult thing right now right so uh you know there were a lot of those different companies that um, crafted their their workspace towards uh, collaboration to making it more enjoyable and to actually enable this collaboration and uh well being right now in this uh setup of uh 100% remote work, this is becoming uh, really difficult, right? So um, so understanding how you can actually enable uh, a collaborative culture uh, within the setup of having people spread all over the world 
that's uh, I guess there's no easy answer, but uh, you might spot some things that are going against that, right? If there's anything uh, that actually makes this collaboration more difficult, if it's actually disturbing, not helping um, people to uh, to collaborate more, uh, that might be one of the red flags that uh, that uh, that is to be spotted uh, and that goes against being building a strong engineering culture. Then uh, we touched uh, upon the um, processes and tools. So I would say having anything, uh, and we're gonna get to that later on because uh, we're gonna we're gonna speak about uh, well industry and what others say about it. Uh, uh, so I'm gonna get back to that. But uh, about these processes and tools. If it's set up in a way that is disturbing, that it that creates friction, that you I don't know you need to fight for accesses for a long uh, while, and there's anything that actually you know makes uh, using those processes and tools difficult for you as an engineer, I would say it's also a red flag. So instead of you know having technology helping you, you end up uh, in uh, in a situation where it actually. Uh, disturbs you it creates friction so i would say that this is another red flag and uh well, the third thing uh the one that we didn't touch upon so I, i'm gonna um uh, you know um, um go back a little bit to delivery fundamentals the, the third thing i think is really really important uh is to make sure that you're you're striving to deliver high quality product so uh you know skipping quality in the equation and there are, of, of course there are all those different dimensions of quality. There's performance, there's security, there's like a huge topic. We could have a, a whole different discussion uh, about it, right? But uh, if you're striving to, uh, if you're not striving to deliver high quality product, that's also um, a kind of a red flag that you're not being building a strong engineering culture. Well, of course, uh, you might end up cutting corners here and there, uh, Obviously, my my quality background goes against that, but I understand that um, context is really important. So um, there are situations where you need to, you know, um, have a, a bigger risk appetite and just just move forward. Uh, but still, you need to include some ingredients of this quality. So um, uh, so making sure that. Uh, uh, that you don't skip that and the the quality is is there um that's also um uh, if it's if it's good uh, if if you're making sure that uh, you know um teams are uh, sharing the responsible for uh, responsibility for the for the quality making sure that the services or products they deliver they meet the agreed quality standards that's a good sign if you're going against that uh, if you're not having that if you're skipping it entirely that's a, that's a red uh, red flag for me uh, and uh, and of course it's it's a difficult topic i, I mentioned one thing um, that uh, it has to be agreed quality standards because it's always well there's no easy definition of quality so you always need to bring on board all those stakeholders or your key stakeholders and uh, and understand uh, what for them contributes towards that what's their uh, view and try to find you know a uh, common ground uh, for that uh, and as you go forward, making sure that you stick as you said you stick to this common ground you you look at the strategy but of course you adjust if there's anything happening along the way that uh, well forces you kind of to, to you know to change your direction for a, for a while. So you mentioned those three things: striving to deliver high quality product. Uh, I, I want to sort of put that in 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 real life uh, examples. In the sense, how can you strive against delivering a high quality product by uh, skipping testing? one thing uh, by uh, you know just uh, omitting good practices um, I imagine by going into tech debt that you never intend to pay back because tech debt uh, contrary to popular opinion another buzzword it's not something terrible sometimes tech debt just makes sense sometimes it's necessary because you can't move through time yet we're working on this at Maduro. uh so sometimes when you have a deadline you can't uh, just you know figure out a way around it but you always have to intend to to pay it back nicely set up processes and tools of course it's imaginable how you could go against that just not having those or having those someone knowing it somewhere but not having it written down in confluence or a shared space in notion but i'm curious 
how do you go against collaboration? Because on a scale from minus one, zero, one, <laughs> one is having nicely set up processes, zero is not having set up processes, minus one is having terrible processes set up. And usually you're in zero. Same goes for high quality product or low quality product, but you don't develop a product that's, you know, if, if you're trying to make a bank, you can make a good banking app, uh, not high quality banking app, but you're not going to make a banking app, let's say by accident without malicious intent that robs people's money. But how do you go against collaboration? Because I don't think there's a zero with collaboration. You either collaborate and there's a benefit or you don't collaborate to the point where it actually becomes the opposite of the spectrum, minus one. How have you seen or how would you describe going against collaboration? So, so there are two topics. I'm gonna I'm gonna start with the first one. Uh, right. You mentioned this this quality thing. Uh, one interesting thing that I observe is uh, actually sometimes digging too much into it, and you know, um, uh, picking up all those details and and trying to make the perfect thingy, uh, perfect product, perfect service. That's also going against the quality in a way, right? Because uh, then you're spending time on, you know, polishing it to uh, to something uh, spectacular, but then you're losing time. As we mentioned, um, we are in a dyna dynamic environment. Things are changing uh, really fast and you need to uh, make sure that your competition doesn't go ahead. So uh, you need to sort of balance that, right? So you, you need to be sure that uh, you're not um, uh, going too deep and you're not going into all those uh, little uh, details and, you know, uh, spending hours, days, weeks on, on polishing, crafting the perfect thing, whereas your uh, competition already launches something, gathers feedback and adjusts, right? That's how the, the whole Agile thingy came up, right? To... Uh, make sure that we are, you know, um, launching something that is a minimal viable thing, uh, and we start iterating on that. We start gathering feedback, but it's already working. It's already there. It's already gathering attention, uh, and you know, you're probing and you're adjusting on the way, and it's actually a nice thing. And you know, uh, um, going too deep and, and and trying to figure out perfect solution, I think that goes against the quality as well. Now, uh, coming back to uh, to the second part of your question about uh, collaboration, uh, how do you go against that? Uh, and, and we're uh, actually moving a little bit towards um, uh, what, what what's there in the in the industry? Uh, so uh, there's there's a really um, a nice case study from uh, I believe Spotify when they were uh, explaining uh, how they uh, build up their engineering culture. And uh, the, if you look at all those different people speaking about um, how to craft um, a, a great engineering culture, what they mention is that um, you. Um, allow your team to have a lot of autonomy. So you allow your team to figure out ways to build things. You you, you, you bring them your business problem, um, like you want to build a bridge or something, and you let them figure yeah. out ways to actually do that. But what you want to make sure is that uh, their individual ideas uh, of, of all those teams um, are all aligned towards the same direction. So they might have brilliant ideas, brilliant things, but the worst that can happen is that uh, each of these teams is actually going its own direction. And separately, uh, each of those teams, uh, each single team is actually doing a great thing. Uh, the thing is that you need to make sure that all the you know all the vectors are, are aligned in the in the same direction, so that as a whole, uh, as a business. Um, as a product, as a service, as a, whatever is is it that you're doing, uh, you're moving towards the same direction. So making sure that the company, the business goal of the entire thing uh, is actually uh, more important uh, than than the individual goals of uh, of your teams, still leaving leaving them a lot of autonomy uh, to actually. Um, you know, um, figure out ways to do that. Uh, one other thing that was interesting there in the in the Spotify case study was um, usually within uh, such uh, such environments where you have uh, teams that are autonomous, 
uh, and you have a, a big complex system, the way it would, it will work uh, would probably be that uh, each team is responsible for a single component of your of your entire ecosystem. So um, one team is going to be responsible for this small part, other team is going to be responsible for this part. And uh, the way it will work is that if uh, there's anything that the team A wants to change in a component B, the first thing they will do, probably they will go to the team B and ask them to do it, right? Because it's their component, they, they wanna, you know, they don't want to uh, disturb them. Uh, they will ask them, hey, can you do this for, for, for us? Because we are dependent on this one and we, uh, we wanna make sure that uh, we have those changes. And what happens uh, when uh, team B uh, doesn't have capacity to do that, uh, in a great engineering culture, what happens is that uh, team A can actually do the changes themselves and then ask the uh, the team b to review them uh, to make sure that they didn't break anything and that enables collaboration a lot if that doesn't happen uh, you have you know all those small disturbances and it's it's not an easy uh, state to achieve actually to have that in place uh, it's easy to say uh, that you can you know allow anyone to make changes anywhere uh, but then um, you know having this this culture of uh, Col collaborating on it uh, in, in all the different ways, for example, asking for reviewing the changes, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's a sign of a, of a great uh, engineering culture. So I would say, uh, you know, it's a, it's, it's a difficult thing, but there might be some things that are um, actually stopping you or, or kind of disturbing in, in, in having this uh, collaboration. So I would say, um, um, as you said, there's. Uh, I, I believe there's no state of uh, no collaboration at all because it's always a team, and there, there's going to be always opportunity to at least meet once, uh, etc. But the important thing is in in this whole equation is to to have enablers uh, for for all the different um, uh, for all the different um, um, things that the, that the team can do. To to strengthen this uh, this collaboration, so all the rituals you can have in place, and sometimes it happens that uh, removing those rituals is actually the way to go as well. So making sure you know that you have uh, that you have uh, a, a culture, an ecosystem that actually allows that to happen, uh, that's really nice. If you don't have it, then probably your collaboration uh, possibilities will be lower uh, than what you. Uh, could have if, if that was in place. I see, I see what you're saying uh, that you know rituals are very important, but also you can never find yourself in a situation of we've always done it this way, right? Because that's that's a dangerous uh, situation in any business. Um, so thanks for opening my eyes because when I was asking this question, my mind was really set on how do you create bad collaboration or prohibit or go against because i was thinking in terms of the individuals right uh, especially that even complaining by the water cooler is a form of collaboration because you right. exchange ideas you exchange i didn't like that because this you know went against all my work or it won't make sense in the future this is also a form of collaboration so when you pointed this at much more of a inter-team setup than inter individuals that that was a, that was an eye opener and what you mentioned about uh, uh, being too nitpicky before releasing trying to make this perfect having this tunnel vision uh, we are streaming to LinkedIn among other platforms and uh, Reed Hoffman if I'm not mistaken from LinkedIn uh, has this famous quote uh, Reed Hoffman the founder of LinkedIn if you are not embarrassed by the first version of your release you've launched too late right so uh, right. I think. Of course, it is something that's supposed to be a quote, so it has to be slightly controversial. So you aren't always supposed to live in a state of embarrassment with your releases. But I think our audiences and you uh, get the gist of it, that you're it, it, done is better than perfect, basically. Right. Right. Uh, right. In, in most cases, I would like to throw some uh, some questions from the comments that we've got. I actually see more people joining. Very great to have you here. Um, so I've got a question from Nestor. Nestor asks, how do you enable proper engineering culture to be implemented on remote teams who are new to a company culture? Because I think that we've been discussing a rocket ship that everybody sort of knows each other. But what happens when there's a rocket ship? There's culture. Everybody's good. 
and then someone new is supposed to board mid-flight how do you make sure that both they are assimilated well but also the team is in the best position to be welcoming a new team member so that there are two two things i i want to touch upon uh answering that question great question by the way nestor thanks for that um so one thing is um making sure that you build uh, habits in the team so transforming whatever is that you do to a habit of uh you know doing things like we, we mentioned this thing about failures along the way and uh that uh to 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 build a great engineering culture, you need to uh, understand that failures are going to be there, but also uh, always learn from them and um, treat them as an opportunity to grow. So um, having this habit in place that you don't even think about it, but it actually happens. It just happens along the way. Of course, there's no easy way. There's no easy answer how to build this habit, but transforming what if, what if, whatever is it that you do and you start repeating it into uh, into a habit uh, that strengthens this this engineering culture a lot because then whoever new joins he, uh, he or she just sees that um, you know uh, this is how things are going people are doing it uh, always uh, like that right uh, so uh, this person comes on board and and sees that aha so so when this happens they do this and that and it's uh, it's not really a, a process or standard. It's actually a, a habit of, of, of doing things um, um, a particular way. And of course, uh, again, uh, it's practically impossible in a, in a complex environment to, to figure out one perfect way of, of, of reacting to things. It's always going to be you know, bound to, to context and, and everything around it. But uh, seeing... You know some specific signals and 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 having um, some ingredients that that, that you see that are uh, contributing to the situation, uh, um, and understanding oh so uh, seeing that this and this and this happens what I can do is uh, uh, is react uh, in a particular way, uh, so this is this is one um, one one thing uh, to the equation to to make sure that you you have habits and one other thing uh, again it's rating back to to a spotify case um you might think that uh you know um having a huge autonomy goes uh, goes against uh, uh putting in place some standards we we were talking about it about strong tooling and processes and uh Usually, what what companies do is they try to put standards in place, right? To to make sure that all the teams follow um, some 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 great practices. But uh, giving team autonomy, uh, surprisingly enough, it actually uh, enables those standards to spread among the teams. Because if if one team will use a, a particular process or tool, and it's gonna work for them, and they're gonna you know um, exhibit it uh, a lot, they're gonna be very vocal about how how it helped them uh, in um, in whatever uh, they were doing. Uh, what what can happen and what usually happens is that other team will pick it up and then another team will pick it up so it, it will organically start spreading among the teams because they will see value in that they will actually have uh, their own desire to to follow a, a particular process or, or use a particular tool and you end up in having a sort of standard right because all those teams will start using uh, exactly the same thing uh, just learning from each other and uh, you know seeing that uh, that it's actually helping them so instead of putting a standard in place and trying to you know forcefully push it forward that you need to do that uh, all, all, uh, always the same way uh, actually giving the team uh, all, all the proper tooling uh, or, or the processes, giving them an ecosystem that they can uh, freely use within the autonomy they have, uh, actually will uh, will um, uh, enable uh, things to happen. And that's that's going to be the same for a new person on board. If there's going to be a variety of things that this uh, uh, this uh, engineer can use, uh, if there there are going to be case studies, if there's going to be you know uh, if there are going to be examples of how it worked in the past, how it helped others, um, this person will, will probably try to, to use it as well, uh, seeing value in that. What's very interesting about this discussion that we're having for the past 40 minutes or so is that even though we are looking at the topic of engineering culture, there haven't been really any 
tech discussions within this. This is much more a, a human psychology 101 discussion or much more a crash course from Wukash on, uh, on, on on leadership, on team management, right? So uh, I, I really liked uh, the part in your answer where you, where you mentioned that, uh, you know, this is just as much a benefit for both sides because essentially a new team member assuming that let's say for the purpose of this example that they're not a junior you're not sort of teaching a waiter how to be a waiter from scratch but they have been a great waiter in other restaurants a senior team member or even just a strong regular team member joining a team is like a free mini audit because they're coming from a separate place they have seen other things you're hiring them for a reason based on their experience and what you've seen and you know, them coming in with a fresh set of eyes can just look at everything that you've used to been doing, all those rituals, and say, you know what, actually, in my previous company, we, we, we made the same mistake that you guys are doing now, and we fixed it with ABC. So it's also something that you're not just supposed to be, oh, I need to welcome someone into my new house, but this is something very much beneficial. This is like an added value, a bonus to the recruitment that you're getting with the new employee, right? Exactly, and I'm glad that you that uh, that you uh, brought up this topic. Uh, of course, and that's another sign of of a strong engineering culture, allowing to you know um, constructively challenge things and to learn from that, and uh, um, you know eventually will actually uh, end up in the whole team benefiting from that. Not only this new person, but also the entire the entire team. And actually, this this uh, actually uh, um, is also true. Uh, for technical proficiency, you might bring on board someone uh, who is experienced in a particular, uh, you know, tooling or, or, or processes or methodology, and uh, this this person will actually um, allow your team to grow. Uh, so, so it's a it's a great sign of uh, of, of a strong engineering culture, uh, making sure that your uh, your ecosystem uh, allows for that to happen, uh, and uh, you have an open-minded people on board. Who are open to 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 accept that that uh, someone uh, from outside might might bring fresh perspective? I, I think you should actually be worried if you're getting a new team member and they're just cut from the same cloth. And yeah, there's no comments. Everything is just fine. I think that's the beautiful thing about diversity. And I'm not talking in the sense of uh, the typical understanding of diversity in terms of gender, ethnicity, but any type of diversity always forces you to question things internally and externally because it's not bad to question diversity if it's coming from a place of curiosity if it's coming from a place i want to expand my understanding so once again this is basically a psychology uh, live stream not a, not a psychology <laughs> leadership live stream not that much just engineering we have a great question from radek because we once again like i mentioned we're discussing abstract concepts here because these right. are sort of things that you th this is a lens we're discussing lenses that you're supposed to apply to the team to the project to the company you're working in but let's crystallize them as much as we can because radic asks how do you measure if the engineering culture is good measurements like you know actual metrics uh if you're asking me but you're not i'm asking myself uh i don't know employee retention uh delivery of products on time mm, these are sort of the you know, I'm a non-delivery person. So please tell me and tell the audience what would be the universal things that regardless of whatever the project is about, whatever the company is doing, this means engineering culture, good or bad. Of course, I have this saying that, uh, you know, the uh, the answer for a very difficult question should it start depends. with, it, it depends, right? So <laughs> uh, I would say uh, that's the case. I mean, uh, we were we were starting this discussion trying to understand what constitutes a great engineering culture. And we were saying a lot about uh, autonomy. We were saying a lot of, uh, about collaboration, but also we were saying a lot about alignment because without alignment, uh, things just won't move forward, right? You might have great teams with great ideas that are working autonomously, but if each of these teams is, you know, pulling its own direction, uh, the direction of the entire ship uh, might be uh, sort of chaotic, right? It's going to be, you know, um, um, uh, going circles instead of uh, going a direction that, that you want it to go. So I would say uh, on a very high level, 
what you can see is that uh, you know um, whatever is is it that you're doing, whether it's um, um, a, a, a service company, whether it's a product company or anything else, if it's moving forward and uh, you're you're gathering. Uh, you know, positive uh, feedback also about it. Uh, that's that's one sign of a, of a great engineering culture, right? That uh, that you don't have, you know, all the different puzzles of uh, of the whole picture uh, not fitting to each other and not uh, not moving, you know, the entire thing um, in the direction uh, that is. Uh, that is defined by by the strategy, and of course you you, uh, uh, you, you need to include people in this equation. So uh, you know, asking them if uh, ingredients of engineering culture uh, that uh, that they value um, are there, uh, or if there's anything that uh, you can improve, and actually reacting on that. So <clears throat> that's a, that's an important bit as well. If you see. If you ask your people uh, what what defines an engineering culture for them, uh, and they tell you about those things, and then you try to understand if you have this in place, and you end up uh, discovering you don't, improving those things, uh, that's one of the measures you can have, right? So uh, I don't know to to give you an example. Uh, if people are telling you we have friction in this particular place, it takes a week to get access to a specific tool, and you can improve that. Uh, reduce this friction to enable them, you know, to to work, uh, and you reduce that to one day. There, there's your measure, right? But that goes to one particular highlighted problem, right? So there's no easy answer for that uh, for that question. I believe uh, it's always, you know, uh, going down to details of those ingredients of engineering culture, uh, making sure that uh, you you improve them if you see uh, there are any. Uh, any things that uh, that go against uh, uh, collaboration, against alignment, uh, against autonomy, uh, that that's that's uh, that's something you can observe and and try to improve. I'm gonna step into Radix's shoes and lead with a follow up question here. I'm gonna be right. more. I'm, I'm gonna be more annoying. I'm not gonna let you off so easy because I don't think I got an answer. Because you know. I'm not looking, of course, we can't really draw a direct correlation and causation relationship between if people are leaving, then it's because of bad engineering culture. No, they might be leaving because they got a better job. They might be leaving because they need more money. They might be leaving because they won't ever code again. But, you know, there are things that when you see a company from the outside might be indicative of that. So it's not always this means that this is a bad engineering culture, but some flags that might be leading you towards it is i'd say so just like you mentioned the feedback right because you can't really measure alignment or, or collaboration that much feedback sure. all of that will be uh qualitative not quantitative right you you, you can't right. try to put it on a scale or nps something but in terms of just like pure consequences of bad engineering culture so employee retention lacking uh short uh, time of tenure at a company if you join so not only the fact that people are leaving, but for how long they have been at that company. Uh, missed deadlines. I think that's uh, all, you know, missed deadlines happen for many reasons, but also if you've got a bad, bad engineering culture, you will have missed deadlines. Any other things that you'd mention in terms of just not exactly bad engineering culture equals, but bad engineering culture, highly likely that consequences. There's, there's this ingredient, what is good and bad, right? I mean, good... Uh... Good is a is is a white word. So for for some companies, uh, you know, um, some particular uh, um, things might be good. For some others, in other contexts, that might be something really bad that is not helping them moving moving things forward. But going down to uh, so so this is uh, that's why I started uh, my answer with it depends, right? Because good for for in one context might mean good in other contexts but on a, on the processes and and technical level uh which you can also measure uh we, we we were saying about knowledge sharing for example right if you don't have if you have no single uh space for knowledge sharing um whether it is a time slot or you know or a tool uh that is that enables knowledge sharing uh, that that's a that's a sign that there's something wrong, right? But when you list all the all the different um, 
meetings that you have in place uh, and uh, you end up having you know a dozen of them that shows something right that shows that uh, that you're embracing this thing for example that you're including knowledge sharing and of course you can't simply measure that by the the number of meetings you have rather the outcomes from those meetings so uh, if we spend I don't know uh, if, if we meet once a week uh, to discuss something what are the outcomes of that what did we what were we able to produce is there a service is there a product is there something that comes out of of uh, of those things right uh, on the technical level uh, one of the things uh, that is uh, really disturbing for engineers is that uh, it, it is obviously uh, working with code. And uh, if you have uh, an architecture or code that is not easily maintainable, so it takes them you know, um, a significant amount of time to actually uh, add new things because they need to dig deeper and, as you said, fight this tech debt. Um, what you can measure is uh, if you improved this time, right? If, if it was uh, always... Um, um, a few days um, more just because you needed to fix things before you started building uh, new things on top of them and you were able to improve that and you see that uh, we're getting faster, that's that's a, a really uh, nice measurement as well, right? So you can you can see it in, in numbers that the time improved, for example. Uh, so as I said, going uh, deeper into details uh, and understanding what's there, um, I, I might might bring you the the, the answer for that. Um, there's one other thing about uh, mm, I, I, I was I was um, telling about you know exhibiting what you're doing, being very vocal about it. Uh, so also uh, understanding if you have you know uh, if you have uh, um, a great place for storing your documentation, uh, making sure that it's easy accessible to all the all the people involved. And uh, maybe you know, once in a while, checking how many how many of your projects have that, also a nice measurement, right? Definitely, definitely. Uh, I'm stepping out of Radix shoes. Uh, we have <laughs> another question from Nestor. I'm loving follow up questions. So Nestor asks because we spoke you and I about bad, good. Here's a question of the journey from one to the other, or trying to remedy what you have. Nestor asks how an engineering culture can help ease the stress of dev teams, especially when you're in a crunch. Seriously, some dev members usually face a lot of emotional problems at such a scenario. Like I said, psychology 101 with a little bit of leadership. Please. <laughs> right. Uh, well, very difficult question, I would say. Uh, I guess I would I would circle back to, uh, to this, you know, uh, environment of uh, uh, of collaboration uh, and also uh, this this autonomy that I mentioned. Whenever you allow the team uh, to make their own decisions, how to uh, move things forward, how to survive, what to you know remove from the scope if time is not our friend. Um, if if you don't uh, you know push it from above, but uh, rather uh, give give a great autonomy to the team, uh, how they can you know figure out a way. Uh, to to do that, uh, that might be one thing for reducing stress because it, it will be it will be them uh, in the end eventually deciding uh, what can they fit and what they can uh, what they cannot right. Uh, one of the ways I'm I'm thinking about, uh, but I guess there are, uh, you know all, all the different ways and and maybe it doesn't come to my mind uh, right now. Um, so uh, so yeah. Uh, mm, one other thing that that that, uh, that I'm thinking is, uh, you know, uh, making sure that um, whenever you fail, uh, you actually learn out of that, uh, and not being afraid to fail. Because I guess the stress comes uh, from the fact that, uh, you know, w w we are thinking that uh, mm, uh, we know from the from the very start that having limited time and having a huge scope to squeeze into that. Uh, that time box, uh, we're not going to make it. Um, so highlighting those risks, uh, making sure that, uh, you know, um, um, we, we, uh, we are prepared for, for things uh, that might go wrong, uh, that might reduce this, uh, this stress level. So um, knowing from the start what are the possible scenarios and preparing mitigations from that for 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 them um, might be might be a way to go. 
um and 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 of course in the end if you, if you end up uh you know not being able to uh, to deliver um because uh you didn't squeeze it in in the in the mentioned time um rather than uh again trying to uh to find who, who caused it and trying to blame it uh rather understanding what contributed to that and uh for the next iteration um improving things and if, if if it was purely uh coming from from the fact that the, you know there was uh too little time and too much pressure from the business highlighting that stronger uh, and making sure that you know that you you're being uh, heard what 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 often i see what often i observe happens is that you know teams are discussing these things uh within their own environment inside the team but they are not too vocal about it outside. They are not highlighting it enough. And that's a sign of engineering culture as well. Uh, we started this discussion saying that engineers should be important stakeholders of business decisions. So making sure that your engineers are being heard, uh, that's an important factor that can contribute into reducing the stress. In my opinion, at least, of course, I'm not an expert in psychology. You are, you are. that's why I have you here. Come on, don't be humble. <laughs> Uh, no, I, I think I, what I wrote down is because, like I said, uh, and like Nestor said, emotional problems, uh, a lot of stress, stress results from there is a goal. I'm not sure if I can make it. You're simply stressed of failure, You're stressed for not delivering. That's a personal thing. That's a team thing. That's a client thing. You know, many stakeholders of shame to go around in this in this party, so to say. So when you have the fear of failure, the best thing that you can do is... Uh, sort of prepare for failure, just like you mentioned. If failure, then we do this. If failure too, then we do that because you understand and you make yourself familiar with the concept of this just might happen. We might mess up. And, uh, and, and exactly. in that case, we won't be focusing on the emotionality of it all. We will have to swallow our pride, but we will know what the next step is immediately. Uh, especially... Just yeah, sorry, go on. Sorry to, to interrupt. Just yesterday, I was on a, on a great presentation uh, from Steve Upton. Uh, he was uh, he was giving a speech about building a culture from chaos. He was uh, touching on the topic of uh, chaos engineering. And uh, one great thing that he mentioned, uh, he, um, he was highlighting the case of uh, Netflix, where they had just two principles uh, uh, that were, you know, always there with their engineers. One was that they were trying to build the thing that doesn't have a single uh, point of failure. And the second principle was assuming that you're not doing uh, point one correctly. So this was this was a great one. So always being prepared and always trying to understand because it's always a hypothesis within complex environments, within complex system, it's impossible or nearly impossible, very difficult to actually make sure that uh, you are going to stick to this first principle, that there's not going to be a single point of failure. And then, uh, you know, uh, 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 accepting the fact that you might not be doing it properly and being prepared for that is a great thing. So uh, testing this hypothesis uh, using different things, uh, using chaos engineering, for example, is a great way to go because then uh, you're not uh, uncertain anymore, right? You're actually um, uh, accepting the fact that uh, it might happen. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And just to wrap up, you've served me a smooth transition of on a silver platter, so to say, because uh, if, if I were to sum this up, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar, just in case the audience isn't. In philosophy, there's something called philosophical razors. It's like a principle or a rule of thumb that allows you to shave off unnecessary things and go to the conclusion as fast as possible. So I see two razors essentially here uh, in our discussion. One is Occam's razor that usually states the simplest explanation is usually the, the one. And the other thing which you mentioned uh, never attribute to malice that which can be adequately explained by stupidity this sounds a little bit harsh let's change stupidity to ignorance most mistakes don't happen because someone wakes up and says i'm gonna mess it up at work today i can't wait to figure out these problems for those people but much rather simply not thinking about things so it's just uh, unexpected outcome right yeah so yeah. uh Ukash, uh we got to do this again some other time soon because, uh, uh, you know, we Definitely. didn't talk about QA at all. You have the vast experience to talk about it all. So 
Dear audience, thank you so much for being us, whichever platform you are here with us from. Lukash, thank you so much. Let's do this again sometime soon. And everybody else, see you on our next live stream, Disruption Talks, Disruption Forum. We are unavoidable on the internet. You will find our <laughs> content or our content will find you. Thanks a lot. Thank you a lot. My pleasure that I was here. Thank you a lot. For, uh, thank you all for attending. I uh, hope you liked it. Exactly. See you soon. See you. Thanks.